Good evening and welcome to our evening service. We thank you that uh, you have taken the time to come with us and we thank the Lord that he has placed it in your heart to listen. Uh, we do give thanks for all this thing this day. Now, let us start uh, with by turning to God's word and this is Psalm 62. Psalm 62. We're going to read the whole of the psalm. I can resolve to wait for the salvation of God to the chief musicians of Jeruthun, a psalm of David. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are a vapour. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapour. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this. That power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you render to each one according to his work. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading from his own holy and precious word. Before we turn back to that, let us take a moment uh, to come before God in prayer. Let us all pray. Gracious and ever-blessed God, King of kings and Lord of lords, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. The one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, who has been there from all eternity, who knows no start and will know no end. Gracious Lord, we thank you for each and everything that you've done for us. We thank you for this day that you've given us for the rest we have experienced, for the food you have provided, for the roof over our head and the clothes that we wear. Gracious Lord, we thank you that we live in an area where your Sabbath day is largely adhered to. What a blessing indeed it is. May we be, always be truly thankful. Well, gracious Lord, we thank you for you have blessed us in so many ways, not that we are deserving. And the truth is, so often we are so ungrateful. We may give you lip service, but while grumbling in our hearts. But, O oh Lord, we thank you that our blessings are not based on our worthiness. And our salvation is not based on our worthiness. For who could stand? For all have fallen short of the glory of God. O oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world, who tabernacled amongst us, and who bled and who died on that cross. We thank you, O oh Lord, that he was willing to take the punishment that we so rightly deserve. And what is more amazing is not only do you, through him are we declared righteous, but that you impute the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us. Our blemishes are covered. Our sin is completely masked. Oh, what an amazing promise that is, Lord. And we thank you that it is a promise from your very own word. And that you are unable to lie. 
For you to lie would result in you not be no longer being God, for you cannot sin. Unlike us, we fall so easily, and have we have to admit that we have sinned and let you down this day in word and thought and in deed. Forgive us, O Lord. Forgive us not just for what we do, but what we fail to do. Forgive us when we fail to come before you in prayer, when we fail to praise you as we ought, or we fail to meditate upon your word. Help us to be found more and more in your word, Lord. That word that is so precious. O gracious Lord, we pray for uh, those around the world tonight who are not able to meet openly, who are not able to own a copy of your word without risk of uh, beating, imprisonment or even death. But we thank you, Lord, that even in spite of the worst that humanity can do, yet their faith is so steadfast. We thank you for the grace that you've given. Lord, we pray for all those who are involved with the persecuted church, Lord. All those who uh, minister, all those who help set up and run, all the missionaries and people you have called, Lord, to go out to these dangerous regions. But, O oh Lord, help us not to ignore our own calling here. For although we have not been sent, truly the harvest is plentiful. For we can look out this night and we see the lights on. We see lights on in homes and houses. And yet sadly many of them have little thought of their souls and little thought of you or attending your house. We pray, Lord, that the pews of your house may be filled up once again, that people may come, Lord, that you may be, have such a strong calling in their lives. But help us, O Lord, to go out into the community. Help us to be your light. Use us as your chosen vessels. May, our light, may your light radiate from us. Lord, we thank you for each and everything that you do for us. For you give us so much. And yet we are so quick to respond with very little. Lord, help us for these few moments to cast our cares and our worries upon you. Remove all distractions. Remove all temptations from the evil. And may the word that is to be preached, although it be taken from the lips of a human being, may it actually be from you on high. May you Melt the hardest of hearts. May you break down the most stubborn of defences. Forgive us our many sins, Lord. For Jesus' sake and glory we ask. Amen. Now, I'd like to turn back to that portion of scripture we read. And in fact, the verses I would like to focus on are verses 5 to 8. So let us reread them. So Psalm 62, verses 5 to 8. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God is always our mighty rock, our deliverance, our fortress and our refuge. We can trust him at all times, including these uncertain times. In fact, the insecurity of our current times ought to not only encourage us to trust God even more, but also to realise that we can place no trust in humanity itself. We certainly cannot rely on our flourishing economy or the recent pandemic display, has certainly displayed that we cannot rely on the wonders of medical science. Good a gift as these are from God. This world can be brought to its knees so very quickly. We may not feel confident in the wisdom of our leaders of our country who seem so quick 
to turn so called turn to so called worldly experts, but never to give God a passing thought. However, tonight we can accept the invitation of Psalm sixty two and put our full trust in God. He's our refuge at all times. We are living in uncertain times. There's certainly no question about that. Following the days of COVID-19, we've now come to the war in Ukraine, which seems to be going ongoing, and also seems to be the blame and excuse for the constant price hikes we see. The constant gloomy financial forecasts we see daily, along with the continued cost of living struggles, and even seeing people resorting to using food banks and switching off their heating. In times like this, we may wonder, where is God? Firstly, we acknowledge the uncertainty of these times in which we live though also acknowledging that other times are not as secure as we might wish, we really do have a habit of looking at the past with rose-tinted glasses. Nevertheless, in our faithful God, we can find what Isaiah calls the stability of our times. Chapter 33, verse 6. We can have confidence in God's steadiness, even when everything else around us feels shaky. Psalm 62 makes a similar point in a different way. Verse 8 urges us to trust in God at all times. Let's notice that again. When are we to trust in God? At all times. Not just in the good times, not only in times when we feel secure and safe, but at all times, which includes these uncertain times. What does it mean to trust God? The Hebrew verb translated here as trust is batach or batach. Uh, apologies for my butchering of that word. B-A-T-A-C-H. But it means trust, feel safe, be confident, or rely upon. I'm reminded of how I felt as a young boy when I would be scared and I would hold on tight to my parents. I could go to a place where I knew I was safe. It was a place where I felt secure. No threats in my mind there when I was with them could harm me, especially when I was safe in their embrace or by their side. I could relax in that feeling of just closeness. And that is rather similar to what it's like to trust God. We don't hold on to a fading or distant hope. Rather, it's a very real place where we can go. God strengthens us. He encourages us. He builds us up when we're low. And he never turns away when we come to him. Let's take comforts from the words of Jesus in Luke 11.13. If you then, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Why should we trust God? Because of who God is. Let's take some time tonight, just very, to, just very briefly, consider some of the attributes of God. In this short time we have together, we're only going to scratch the surface of this rather huge topic. But I would encourage you to study this more in depth for yourselves. So firstly, let us consider. God is immutable. He never changes. Malachi 3, 6 reads, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And who he is never changes. His attributes are the the same from before the beginning of time as we know it, into eternity. His character never changes. He never gets better or worse. His plans do not change. His promises do not change. Surely this 
ought to be an incredible source of joy for us as believers. In an ever-changing world where the moral compass swings wildly, we can put our faith in a God that is unchangeable. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Omnipotent is a breakup of two words. And it means to have ultimate power. Omni is all and potent means powerful. God is able and powerful to do anything he wills without any effort on his part. It's important to note the anything he wills part of that statement. Because God cannot do anything that is contradictory or contrary to his own nature. Hebrews 6, 8 puts it like this, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the people of the hope set before us. God is omniscient. omniscient. He's all-knowing. And because God is all-knowing, we can trust that he knows everything we're going through today and everything we will go through tomorrow. When we meditate on this truth, especially in light of his other attributes of goodness and love, it makes it easier to trust him. With all we have going on in our lives, from the very serious to the mundane, God knew us before he formed us. Our sinful acts may shock even those closest to us, maybe even ourselves. But God knew about these already and was still willing to come to earth and die for us. What a saviour! God is omnipresent. He is always everywhere. Consider the words of Psalm 139. 7 to 10. I was actually hoping to sing this tonight had we been in church environment, but let's just read them instead. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. This ought to bring deep comfort to Christians who struggle with loneliness and deep sorrow. In a very real way, God is always near us, closer than our thoughts. The knowledge that we are never alone calms the troubled sea of our lives. And all did not speak to our very soul. God is wise. He is full of perfect, unchanging wisdom. Wisdom is more than just head knowledge or intelligence. A truly really wise person is someone who understands all the facts and makes the best decisions. A wise person uses his heart, soul and mind together with skill and competence. But even the wisest man on earth, or woman for that matter, would never come close to being as wise as God. For his knowledge and his wisdom is perfect. God can't learn anything new. For this would mean that he was less than perfect before. And, and if this were the case, he would cease to be God. God is faithful. He is infinitely, unchangingly true. As with all of God's attributes, they are not separated, isolated traits, but interconnected parts of his whole being and his perfect being for that matter. His faithful net cannot be understood apart from his immutability. So when we read that God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself, we see his attributes working together. The fact that he is unchanging 
means he can never not be faithful. Does that not give us confidence here tonight? God is good. He is infinitely, unchangingly kind and full of goodwill. Just like his other attributes, God's goodness exists with his, within his immutability and infinite nature so that he is unchangingly always good. Christians find it easier to affirm the goodness of God when things are going well. However, when life takes a downward turn, that's when we sadly start to begin to question God's goodness. Psalm 34 verse 8 reads, O taste and see that the Lord is good. The writer is inviting us not just to believe that God is good, but to experience God's goodness. Taste is not a knowledge. It's not just a, a thought. It's, it's a, a, a physical action. We are called to experience God's goodness, to test the water. God is merciful. He is infinitely, unchangeably compassionate and kind. God's mercy is inseparable from his justness. He is infinitely, unchangeably, unfailingly merciful, forgiving, lovingly kind towards us. His mercy is also undeserved by us. It is undeserved mercy, as all true mercy must be. A deserved mercy. It's only a result of justice. There was no right on the sinner's part to the saving mercy of God. Without the mercy of God, we would have no hope of heaven. But because of his mercy, we deserve... Uh, we do, Sorry, we don't get what we deserve. God is gracious. God is infinitely inclined to spare the guilty. If mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is damnation, grace is getting what we don't deserve, which is eternal life. While all humanity benefits from God's common grace, only those who profess, believe and put their faith in Christ receive saving grace. This is what results in our sanctification and our glorification of God, that we might live for him and enjoy him for all eternity. God is love. God infinitely, unchangingly loves us. God is not a stream or fountain of love. Rather, he is the source of all living water that supplies these. God's love is active, drawing us to himself. His love is personal. He doesn't love humanity in some vague sense. He loves his children. And he calls us his children. It's an intimate love. And his love for us knows no beginning and no end. It is a perfect love. It's not based on our worthiness or actions. There is nothing we can do, whatever good or charitable acts that we may perform in this life, that can make God love us more. However, with even more comfort, there is also no sin that we can commit that can make him love us any less. God is holy. He is infinitely, unchangingly perfect. That God is holy means he is endlessly always perfect. And his standard for us is perfection. That's why we need Christ. Without Christ taking the place for us and dying for our sins, we would all fall short his holy standards. The Christian will never have to experience 
God's holy wrath poured out. Through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, the penalty for our sins was paid, and we were imputed with Christ's righteousness. Now, when God looks upon us, he sees Christ's perfect holiness. God is just. He is infinitely, unchangeably right and perfect in all that he does. What does it mean that God is just? Well, it means more than he is just simply fair. It means he always does what is right and good towards all men. Likewise, although this is hard for many to accept, his sentencing of evil, unrepentant sinners to hell is also right and good. In light of God's other attributes of goodness, mercy, love and grace, there are some who might say in error that God is too kind to punish the ungodly. But to believe this means we dull the reality of his infinite unchanging justice. God will have justice for sin. Either from Christ's atoning death or for those who will not accept it, eternal wrath and hell. God is self-sufficient. He has no needs. He is independent. He is self-existent and self-sustaining. Nothing in heaven or on earth has ever contributed anything at all towards the maintenance and countenance of his being. His offer of salvation is completely based off his own good work and perfection. God has no need of us. We must come to him in reliance purely upon him. Because God is self-sufficient, we can go to him to satisfy all our needs. We never have to worry about exhausting or using his never-ending well of goodness, peace, mercy and grace. Consider the words of Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. For someone to worry about this is like a child at the seashore, at the beach on a summer's day, with a bucket and spade, and worrying about using all the water in the sea. Impossible. God is glorious. He is infinitely and beautifully great. The glory of God is, of course, inseparable from all his other attributes. <coughs> Excuse me. So God is eternally, infinitely, unchangingly glorious. His radiance and beauty emanate from all that his, that, <clears throat> excuse me, from all that he is and all that he does. Isaiah 43, 7 says that man was created by God for his glory. Fallen humans will try to find glory in other things or try to make themselves an object of glory. And when those things fail to bring satisfaction, we must decide to humble ourselves and turn our gaze back to the only one who is worthy of our glory. Let us not forget that God is eternally all these things. He cannot change. As I've said couple of times already for him to change would result in him to stop being God. In just a few verses of Psalm 62 God is portrayed as our mighty rock, salvation, fortress and refuge. In God we find hope, deliverance, honour and safety. Even as I could trust my parents because I knew they were there. So we can trust the God who has revealed himself to us in Scripture, and most of all, in Jesus Christ. 
When we trust in God at all times, what difference will this make? The answers of Psalm 62 are surprisingly diverse. Verse 8, for example, says, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge to us, for us. In the safety and security of relationship with God, we are invited to tell God anything and everything. We don't have to hide our fear, doubt, anger, sadness and disappointment. God gives us the freedom to be fully ourselves with him, sharing fully our joys and our sorrows, our longings and our losses. Because God is our mighty rock, our deliverance, our fortress, our refuge, we can trust him at all times, including these most uncertain times. There is no time which God is not trustworthy. In fact, the insecurity of our current times encourages us to trust God even more. We may not be able to rely on a flourishing economy or science. We may not be able to put confidence anymore in our leaders or pundits. But we can still accept the invitation of Psalm 62 and put all our trust in God. He is our refuge at all times. We need to trust God. He doesn't promise that the things we will go through will always be pleasant or even easy, but he does promise that he will never leave our side when we are facing tough times. We can be tempted to give up when the valleys are long, hard and tiring. But if we keep on going and keep trusting God, he'll help us reach the other side. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Now may grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest, abound and abide with you all and all whom you love and all whom you pray for, both this day and forevermore. Amen.